the agenda item three for us final hearing um so without objection we can move into agenda item three discussion and possible action regarding complaints filed by mark littlefield against peck young voices of austin which complaints allege violation of city code chapter 2-2 campaign finance specifically section 2-2-33 disclosure statement required um so i am happy to uh, read through the rules of the final hearing i can also paraphrase them um and i can simply pass it to the complainant for the statement because i believe that the respondent and that neither the respondent or counsel for the respondent has appeared so um with that uh Let, let me just kind of, okay, so usually each side is allowed to open and close before presenting evidence. However, because respondents not appearing, you have 10 minutes for an opening followed by 30 minutes for presentation of evidence. You may skip your opening and move directly to the presentation of evidence if you wish. Do you have a preference, Mr. Littlefield? No preference. Okay then the way if you don't have a preference then the way it will work is that there will be i'll have secretary gober our uh, esteemed timekeeper uh set a timer for 10 minutes um and at the conclusion of 10 minutes if you have more that you want to discuss and more information we can take it from there um does that does that sound good yeah okay um so as chair, I have the option of asking for closing statements as well or dispensing with closings. Um, I, uh, I think it's fair to say that there may not be a, you know what, in fact, instead of making that assumption, we're across that bridge when we get there. I'd like to field your opinions on, on that. Um, okay. So with that, Mr. Littlefield, whenever you are ready to start speaking, for your opening statement slash presentation, Secretary Gober, Secretary Gober will start the time and you can, you can go. Uh, I believe that there's a PowerPoint presentation that I've submitted for this meeting. Do y'all have that? That is a good question. There we go. There we go. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Mark Littlefield. I uh, appreciate your time this evening and you got and your dedication to the city of Austin and obviously to uh, uh, to to this commission. Um, uh, uh, my first request before I get into my presentation is that um, uh, Lynn Carter and staff sent a letter asking for all evidence to be produced uh, and submitted. Uh, uh, I believe on March third, and I submitted mine. Uh, I think a week late. And uh, so in order for you guys to, I think, see it, I'll have to ask the chair to grant me leave for missing that deadline. And um, I apologize for missing the deadline. Um, not sure if you want to take that up now. I'll take that up at the end of my presentation. Let me know if you want me to start right now or You, you can start your, start your presentation. We can, we can discuss that issue later. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I just, this is basically just to kind of review where we were, uh, last month. Um, and this was about great, which was from the city code, the, the, uh, the definitions about electionary communication. Um, uh, and that we have to have, you know, all, all five of these things here. Um, uh, I mean, the communication that, uh, costs $5 or more, uh, 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 uh refers to a candidate or in this case, you know, clearly identifies a ballot measure. Uh, three, that it's disseminated uh, uh, by publication, broadcast, intent, et cetera. Four, that it's, you know, made within a window uh, uh, of, of the election. And five, is capable of, of reaching at least, in this case, we're gonna assume 5,000 people. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we got into express advocacy, uh, which is, means the communication, um, or thing value that refers to a clearly identified candidate or in this instance, a ballot measure. 
Uh, and the number one is those magic words, you know, uh, uh, reelect, vote for, vote against, cast your ballot for. Or number two, which I think is probably more appropriate here, uh, is susceptible to no reasonable interpretation other than as an appeal to vote for or against a specific, in this case, ballot measure. Uh, next slide. So here is the here is the mailer that uh, that caused the complaint to be filed. Uh, it's here in the presentation, and uh, that also be available for you in your evidence packet. But as you see on the second side, uh, on the, uh, the side listed as tired of being ignored, uh, it lists Project Connect. It says on the recommendation of city staff, the council wants you to approve Proposition A. It specifically says Proposition A. Um, and then at the end of that paragraph, it says, if the city staff wins, you lose. Uh, that is Exhibit uh, C1, uh, if you're able to see it later on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Voices of Austin uh, Twitter account, they tweeted uh, 213 times from the day that the account was opened on June 4th, 2020 until November 4th, 2020, their, uh, their election day. The account has not posted any information since November 4th. Uh, included in, in, in Exhibit C2 are, I just gave you the 28 tweets during the last seven days of the campaign. Uh, to kind of give you a uh, sense that, that this was not uh, educational, that this was campaigning. Um, next slide. Uh, here are just two examples where they mentioned Prop A, uh, vote down the ballot, Prop A, the ballot initiative for Project Connect. Uh, if, it pass, you know, if it passes, homeowners will have to pay higher. Um, uh, the next one. City Hall leaders are lying to Austin voters in the media about financing uh, about the financing for Pro Project Connect. Um, uh, and again, those those are in uh, your evidence packet. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, this is uh, Exhibit C3. Uh, this is their Facebook page, um, uh, and and the posts from uh, from the Facebook account closely mirror the tweets from the Twitter account, so I didn't, you know, list all of those. I didn't see anything significantly different. Uh, but again, no posts since November 4th, 2020. Uh, you know, even though, uh, you know, Voices of Austin says that they are an educational pack about many different issues, not just Project Connect, such as, you know, uh, uh, Code Next or budgets, uh, uh, property taxes. But I guess their education efforts ended on, on November 4th. Um, uh, next slide, please. This is just one part of the, uh, of exhibit C3. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is the Facebook algorithm that on the, uh, uh, Voices of Austin campaign Facebook page that says here, here are other related pages and the other related pages happen to be all campaigns. Um, Dave Austin now and Justin Barry for Texas house. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is part of exhibit C5, which is a press release. This is the last thing. This is the last word we got from Voices of Austin. The last thing they said, uh, where they recap their efforts. And they specifically say that in the district where Voices of Austin concentrated its efforts to educate the public on Prop A's, uh, Project Connect through mail, newspaper, and social media, the proposition did not pass. Um, you know, thus proving that voter education is so effective and, and, and will continue to make a difference. I mean, this, does, this is, to me, this is a smoking gun. Uh, this, this is where they just flat out admit to us what they did, that where, that where they concentrated their effort, they got the outcome they wanted, uh, which was the proposition did not pass. That is electioneering. Uh, next slide, please. Um, is this activity, to me, this is what the, I think the commission has to determine. Is this activity election communication according to 2-2-31? And if it checks with all these boxes, um, is it communication that costs more than 500 bucks aggregate? Well, yes, there is a mail, there is a website. They had social media accounts. They had paid political operatives. 
um, uh, I, you know, we have to assume that that is well over $500. Uh, is it, is the communication that refers to a clear identified ballot measure by containing the ballot measures number? Yes, they say Proposition A several times. Um, is the communication that is disseminated by publication, broadcast, internet, mass mailings, or a telephone bank or billboard? Yes, we just went through all of that information. It checks that box. Uh, is the communication that is made later than the 61st day before the date of an election in which the candidate the ballot measure cares about? Yes, uh, the mailer specifically was out 32 days um, uh, before election day. Uh, and I just showed you several uh, Twitter accounts that were just in the last seven days before election day. Uh, and is it communication that's capable of reaching at least 5,000 people eligible to vote? Yes, in the, obviously there was a mailer that was sent out uh, and they referenced the areas where they campaigned, which was obviously way more than 5,000 voters in those, in those locations. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Is it susceptible to, or, or to uh, is, is susceptible to no reasonable person interpretation other than as an appeal to vote for or against a specific candidate or measure? Yes, this is express advocacy. Um, uh, check that box. They even admit to it in their final press release. Um, and then the last slide, please. So here we go. Uh, did Voice, Voices of Austin campaign violate 2-2-33? Um, they, it's a person making an expenditure for political advertisement, electioneering communication, or express advocacy. Yes, yes, they did. Um, and, uh, if they did so, then they need to list their largest five contributors, uh, to the account, um, uh, 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 uh making the direct campaign expenditure. And I believe, and I hope that the commission will agree that Voices of Austin did violate this. Uh, and, uh, and they should be, I don't think, <laughs> I know that we're limited in what the commission can do here, but I was hopeful that the commission could compel them, uh, to list, um, uh, their top five contributors. Um, that's probably beyond the scope of what the commission can do. <sighs> but if, if we don't, and this may not be the venue for that remedy, but if we don't, then this is going to happen again, where people use nonprofits to hide their donors uh, and their expenditures and their activity. Uh, and it will make our democracy uh, that much more weaker here in the city of Austin. Uh, I kind of ran through that, but I felt like we'd already gone through this before. I hope that was helpful. Um, and I'll answer any questions if you have any. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Littlefield. Um, so, commissioners, I'm, I'm happy to open it to questions. Um, one thing that I will say is that I've got, I, I have things I would like to say before we uh, kind of dispense with uh, the item via a motion. Um, but I do want to give opportunity for questions or discussion from commissioners, however many questions or comments you have. So. Floor is open and I see Commissioner Greenbrook's hands. So go ahead. So, Mr. Littlefield, you said you assume it's more than $500. Are you offering us any proof that it's more than $500? Um, besides logically it should be? I mean, do you have any proof? Uh, no, ma'am. They, they said that they distributed their mailer wider. Um, and then later on in the campaign, they talk about places where they campaign, the precinct where they campaign. I mean, I walk, worked on a campaign where volunteers printed the flyers and we walked them. Uh, they call this a direct mail. Uh, th they call this a direct mail. But we don't know how many homes or who printed it or anything because all of that is kept confidential. So I feel like the proof is missing. Okay. Secretary Goper. Uh, Mr. Littlefield, I'm looking at your exhibit C4. It seems to be a news article, um, page three of that. 
references yeah. in, in kind of middle of the page, there's a photo of Gerald Daltrey. The next full paragraph after that, it says the PAC spent $5,000 on the war chest with Voices of Austin, another group opposed to the rail proposition. Is, is that part of where you were getting your information that there was more than $500 spent? Uh, yes. So uh, I put that in there, but but uh, and that was about two things. One is is that uh, you know Voices of Austin, you know, did coordinate with another uh, with another political action committee. Uh, they received a five thousand dollar contribution to help pay for their activity, um, and then um, uh, and then uh, uh, if you were at the press conference, and I think it's reported at, at the end of that letter uh, that there's actually members of the press conference who encourage people to vote against Proposition X. And I would say that I've also been involved in many campaigns, um, uh, and I've also uh, had volunteers, um, you know, put stamps on postcards that are printed in house. Um, and um, you know, this was obviously a black. This was a full color slick mailer. Um, uh, we don't know how many houses that it went to, um, but if you if you have a small room of you know less than 20,000 households then printing and postage even if it's a non-union shop um uh you know is is going to cost you you know well over 60 cents you know per piece um you know and if you get it over 20,000 yeah you can get it into the into the 50 cents or maybe even close to right at 50 cents if you're lucky so what i'm saying is that if they send it to more than a thousand households they went over five hundred dollars. Okay, uh, Commissioner McCormick. So we have no idea what their target audience was. Um, whether they, and the reason I'm asking is I never heard of them. I never got anything from them, and I'm pretty active, so I don't know who they targeted or how many. So what they said is, and I'm sorry, Commissioner, was that a question directed at me? Yes. Commissioner, uh, 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 in their uh, in, in their final press release, uh, which I included um, uh, in Exhibit C5, uh, they listed precincts. Uh, uh, they showed a map, and they listed a pre, uh, precincts where Proposition A failed. And uh, all of those precincts were mostly west of Mopac. Um, uh, and that's probably, I know where you live, and that's probably why you did not receive anything from, from them, because you were not in, I guess, that area that they targeted. I did not receive a mail station from them either. Yeah. It's just, I just think that it's kind of weird that they didn't target um, voters who vote all the time. I don't know what their target was. So. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Sure. I know they targeted me. I vote all the time and they targeted me very heavily. Okay. Because I didn't get anything. I didn't even know about them. I got lots of stuff. Okay. You live on the other side of Mopac too. Yes, so. I do. Yeah, and I don't. Okay. All right, commissioners, other, other questions? I'll leave the floor open for just a little bit longer. Um, but I don't want to, don't want to drag it out if there really are no other questions. Well, in that case, um, uh, so it's at the chair's discretion as to whether or not to allow for a closing statement. Um, uh, I'm gonna just ask Mr. Littlefield, would you like to make a closing statement? Okay, got it. No, thank, thank you. you. Okay, um, uh, so, at this point, I think I just want to kind of offer a few words for purposes of the discussion, um, because I think 
the fact that the respondent did not appear, even though the code requires a respondent to a complaint to appear before a final hearing, uh, leaves me a little dumbfounded, if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, this was a complaint that was filed in October. Um, we had a hearing, we tried to have a hearing in November. Um, we tried to have a hearing in December. Uh, we almost had a full hearing in January, um, and then technical difficulties prevented us from completing it. Uh, we gave, um, you know, we tried, we tried to accommodate schedules for the parties, particularly the counsel for the respondent. Um, and we finally were able to have our full, the rest of our preliminary hearing last month, where, you know, I made a point to uh, allow both parties additional time to present their case, their side of the story, um, before we proceeded with more questions on the part of commissioners. Um, at every point, uh, feeling as though I think the commission generally has been patient towards both parties. Um, and I, where, where I'm going with this is that I think it's particularly disrespectful um, for the respondent to not appear. And I, and I want to say that in an open meeting that will be recorded um, so that they can hear and for the benefit of the public and anyone who happens to be listening to this once it's posted online, since it's not being broadcast. It is, it is one thing to make an argument that the jurisdiction, that the commission does not have jurisdiction over them as an entity. At the least, what they could do is appear here and make that argument. Because as far as I recall, I tried my best to review um, each meeting where we had brought this up. As best as I can recall, they at no point said, by the way, in the alternative, this commission has no jurisdiction over us as an entity. Uh, and we don't think we should be, we don't think we have to participate in this process. At no point did they make that argument, as far as I could remember. I could be wrong. Um, so I, as we kind of, discuss uh, a way forward in resolving this particular complaint as we discuss a possible motion to dispose of it. I just want us to kind of keep in mind, keep in mind that this is not okay. Um, and this is the second time in a, a, within the past six meetings that we've had that a party has shown um, some amount of disrespect uh, to the commission, either individually or as a whole. And um, and I plan on doing something about it. Um, so, uh, commissioners, any further discussion? If there's a motion that anyone here has, I'm happy to entertain it. Um, I'll wait for hands, I'll wait for unmutes and people chiming in. Commissioner Greenberg. I mean, just in response to what you're saying, I believe the letter was making the exact point that they made at the preliminary hearing and they saw the way the commission listened to it. So I can totally understand not coming to make the same point again with the same commission. I mean, it's, it's time consuming. Having a lawyer is expensive. It doesn't really seem it. I don't, I didn't take it as disrespect. I, took it as they felt like it would be a waste of time and they didn't do it. Sure. I appreciate that comment. What I'll say is that uh, the the determination that this is a waste of time um, evinces disrespect um, in my mind. And almost it's almost enough just to read word for word the city code provision that says complainant and respondent are required to appear before a preliminary, before a final hearing. Um, and, you know, both parties know the rules at this point. Um, and up until this point, respondent has been participating and we have been deferring to respondent. We've been accommodating respondent's schedule. We've been accommodating, um, you know, technical difficulties so that the respondent can get a fair hearing and participate for them to decide at this point that they are no longer subject to the jurisdiction of the commission 
that they're no longer even respondents or whatever they might kind of perceive, however they might wrap their heads around that provision of city code, I think evinces a level of disrespect. Um, but, but I appreciate, sorry, I'm, I don't want to capitalize the conversation. Commissioner Danberg, you have your hand. I believe that we need to be looking at the evidence that has been presented. I believe that it is uncontroverted in the evidence before the commission that express advocacy, advocacy did occur and that electioneering did occur. Sure, and I'll, I'll just remind commissioners, the, the standard of evidence uh, that we have um, is a preponderance. So I will refer everyone to uh, 2745D, um, where it says that the commission shall make its determination based on the preponderance of the credible evidence in the record. Um, Secretary Gober, you have your hand up. I wanna to speak to the issue of whether there was 500 or more spent uh, obviously, we don't have a receipt for the money that was spent. Uh, because the respondent failed to appear, we don't get to ask a very simple question under oath or the respondent of, did you spend more than $500? And to give the benefit of the doubt to a respondent who has violated the law uh, in, in refusing to come here today, would be to encourage further and future violations of the law. So I think I think we should read into the re, the written response we received from the respondent. At no point, as I've looked through the records, as I've looked through any communication from the respondent, at no point has the respondent said, "We never spent more than five hundred dollars." And if they never spent more than five hundred dollars, it takes one sentence. It is so easy to prove innocence. They, they don't have a duty or a burden to prove innocence, but it would have been so easy to say, we never spent more than $500, case closed, we're done. But they never claimed that. And the one time where we were going to have the opportunity to have them under, did you spend more than $500? And there's no way a complainant could ever know that or prove that without going into their books. And so if we have a ruling today that we can't find that evidence because it wasn't presented, because the respondent didn't show up, then we might as well go home and, and disband the commission entirely for the for the future on these types of claims, because we're never gonna see respondents show up to these in the future ever again. Thank you. And I'd, I'd also just like to remind commissioners that at our preliminary hearing, um, the counsel for the respondent did say that there, uh, I believe it may not have been the express advocacy provision, but the, um, uh, the, the second uh, part of the disclosure requirement, because the disclosure requirement is either, um, it's either electioneering or um, electioneering communication or express advocacy. And I think there was a, the, the words that were used were, um, there may have been a technical violation that was, those words were said by counsel for the respondent in the preliminary hearing. Um, just wanted to remind commissioners of that. Uh, Commissioner Danberg, go ahead. I have a motion if everybody's finished discussing. Um, I, I kind of, I think I've said my piece. I'd, I'd like to kind of, uh, uh, just to make things hopefully a little bit easier, I'd like to hear what the motion is, um, what the motion's about. Uh, what my motion will be if everyone's finished discussing prior um, would be that we find that there has been a violation of city code chapter 22 campaign finance and section 2233 disclosure statement required. Reading their letter, they don't think we have any jurisdiction over them. Correct. That that's that is why um, neither the respondent uh, yeah. themselves or counsel for the respondent appeared because. And we've had people that didn't show up before, but I don't remember what happened. Uh, in the nine years I've been on this commission, so. Sure, I recall. I recall one case involving a um, 
an ice cream taco truck in which the uh, respondent did not show up for um, oh, right. either a preliminary or a final hearing. Um, and we found against that individual um, yeah. that there was a violation. Uh, so there's, there's precedent for finding yeah, violations they're, for they're respondents. Most recent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so just to <clears throat> clarify, Commissioner Danberg, you're, you're interested in a motion that would just make the determination that a violation has occurred. Okay, I'm happy to entertain motions. So go ahead if you'd like to make it. I move that the commission find that a violation has occurred uh, by Voices of Austin violating city code chapter 2-2 campaign finance and section 2-233 disclosure statement required. I second the I second the motion. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Danberg, second by Commissioner Kale. Is there discussion on the motion, commissioners? Commissioner Greenberg? Yes, I'm just uncomfortable with the lack of proof. It really wasn't for the respondent to to prove that it wasn't they didn't spend 500. The burden of proof is on the complainant. Sure, Vice Chair O'Hurry. <laughs> yeah, if I can just could respond to that, I would, I mean, certainly if this were a criminal trial, then there isn't a, uh, perhaps there's not enough evidence, even if it were a criminal trial. But anyway, that, that's not the standard. I mean, the standard really is just preponderance of the evidence more likely than not. And so then we can, one, look at the evidence that has been presented, and then based off the evidence that has been presented, we can certainly infer uh, some, we can make inferences based off of the evidence that's been presented. And the evidence that has not been presented. And so what has been presented kind of to uh, Secretary Gober's point is that we ha we do have a statement from, um, from the respondent and it does not include that, that simple language. So that's, an inference that we can draw. We we also do understand, reasonably so, uh, how much it costs to print something at any of the local print shops, and what it would take to send out mailers on a wide scale. Uh, we also understand what it would cost to pay for ads on Facebook. Even even if our understanding is minimal on that, we understand that the costs in the aggregate more likely than not probably came out to $500. And so we'll make a decision on how we're gonna find on all these issues, but on that element, I think the evidence is, has been sufficient. That's just my perspective. Sure, it, I, I'd like to jump in as well um, and just offer that, you know, the, this, the specific part of city code that's at issue here, um, it, it, it contemplates either electioneering communication, which has that $500 threshold, that $500 requirement, or express advocacy. And part of express advocacy is that it's a communication, um, activity, goods, services, or anything of value that refers clearly to a, to a clearly identified candidate or ballot measure, you have a clearly identified ballot measure, that up to it's susceptible to no reasonable interpretation other than as an appeal to vote for or against a specific candidate or ballot measure. There's no dollar requirement there. It's just there is no other reasonable interpretation that one can draw. Um, as I review some of these communications, I think it is very hard, very hard to have a reasonable interpretation reasonable the keyword interpretation that this is anything other than an appeal to oppose ballot measure even if they it, this this magic words um discussion that was had at, at our last at the preliminary hearing hearings plural um it's you know first of all uh i don't think that's how magic words work how it was described um in part because the, uh, at least under our city code electioneering, when it talks about the magic words, um, says, where did it go? I just had it up. Um, 
it says including such as these words. It doesn't say it has to be vote for, vote against. Um, I, I struggle to find a reasonable interpretation. If someone were to receive this as being like, oh, I'm just being informed about an election and I'm just being informed about the issue that the election is about. Um, it, it seems pretty clear that the sender of this, the, the most, the, I don't see a reasonable interpretation on the part of a reader that this is telling me anything other than vote against Prop A. That's, that's just, that's my take on it. Um, and uh, I, I, I likewise agree that the preponderance of the evidence, given that we know that there was a, almost certainly a large number of houses targeted with mailers, other kind of paid promotion and communication, and almost certainly it exceeded $500. Um, I would have preferred uh, a receipt and dollar figures to confirm that, but based on the evidence that we have before us, um, more likely than not, we passed the threshold under electioneering. But I also think that express advocacy, uh, we've, we've met that and gone past it too. Um, but that is, that's my take on it. Happy to take other discussion comments, commissioners. Okay. Well, if there's no other discussion, then we have a motion and we have a second. What I'm going to do is go through um, the names of commissioners as it appears on the agenda, just like I did earlier in the meeting. When I call your name, please state your vote. I'll confirm your vote. Um, and I will go in that order. Um, so Chair Soberon, I vote aye. Vice Chair O'Hurry. Aye. Vice Chair O'Hurry votes aye. Secretary Gober. Aye. Secretary Gober votes aye. Commissioner Danberg. Aye. Commissioner Danberg votes aye. Commissioner Greenberg. Aye. Commissioner Greenberg votes aye. Commissioner Kale. Aye. Commissioner Kale votes aye. Commissioner Lari. Aye. Commissioner Lari votes aye. Commissioner Lerner. Aye. Commissioner Lerner votes aye. Commissioner McCormick. See your hand up. I'll unmute. Aye. There you go. Uh, Commissioner McCormick votes aye. Uh, Commissioners Ryan and Commissioner Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Villalobos are not present. Then I've counted nine ayes, zero nays. Um, zero abstentions and two absences. Um, is that correct, Lynn? Just want to confirm my tally. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, commissioners. We can proceed to a discussion about sanctions, possible sanctions. Um, I think. Uh, I'm happy to entertain a discussion about it, but I think we could all just as easily start with motions if anyone has them. Um, as a reminder, if you need to look at what, what sanctions are available, um, it is city code 2-7-48, that is our normal sanctions, 2-7-49, that has some campaign, campaign violation specific provisions. Can we so. take a five minute break? You know what, actually, that is a fine idea. Uh, commissioners, are you fine taking um, just a five minute recess? I actually need to get some water. Been talking a lot. Okay. So five minutes, uh, commissioners will recess. It's 9-11 right now. Um, it's 9-12 actually on my computer. So I'm gonna say at 9-17, I expect to fall back. Thank you very much. We'll resume at that time. Great. So it is 9.17 and we're out of recess. Um, okay, commissioners, uh, where we left off, uh, we were about to discuss sanctions or entertain motions. I'm sorry, can we just make sure that the commissioners are all back because I don't think we can proceed oh, sure. until we have everyone that's gonna participate in a vote otherwise they won't be able to vote if they're not present for the entire discussion 
Sure. So then I am going to, um, I'm just going to uh, ask for a uh, verbal confirmation that you're here and ready to go. Um, so Vice Chair O'Hurry, are you back? Vice Chair O'Hurry is back. Okay. Commissioner Lerner, are you back? While we wait for Commissioner Lerner, uh, Commissioner Lari, um, are you are you willing to participate in this part of the hearing? If it's okay for me to go, I'm not feeling well, but if you all need me to stick around, I can. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think we're fine. Uh, Len, I'm just going to confirm that um, the sanctions, does that, is that a majority of the commissioners present or a majority of the commission that's required? Give me just a couple minutes. It's okay. I think it'll go fast. I can stay for it. But then if it's okay, I'll leave right after. Okay. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you, Commissioner Lariana. Sure. Um, all right. So with that, uh, Commissioners, since uh, I think most of us are back, I'll yeah, see Commissioner Lerner as well. Okay, great. Um, so discussion or a motion? The floor is open. Commissioner Kale. Well, just going through the city code chapter two under campaign violations, which redirects us back to sanctions. It looks as appropriate sanction for this is 2-7-48-3. A reprimand is the appropriate sanction when we find that a violation has been committed intentionally or through disregard of the chapter. It may reprimand an official or well, or an employee. Hmm. So, so the way the way I understand it is that uh, 2-7-49 campaign violations, specifically subsection um, G or no, sorry, uh, subsection F, F. Um, uh, redirects us back, and I, I would read into it a uh, uh, individual subject to campaign finance laws uh, okay. rules. So replace official or employee with a uh, respondent in a campaign finance case. Gotcha. It seems to fit the definition of a reprimand to me. Um, because it sounds like, you know, they knew, I don't know if they did this intentionally, but certainly through disregard of what our city code is and says that, that they should do. And um, so uh, that's why I think so. Okay, uh, Commissioner Danberg. So uh, I'll- If uh, that's a motion, I second it. Sure, yeah. so- It's not quite ready for a motion, but that was just me throwing out what I, you know, after reviewing the code. Yeah, uh, Secretary Gober, go ahead. I just always start from the top and, and, and move down. So I'm starting, I'm looking at censure and trying to understand why that wouldn't apply uh, in this instance, kind of reading the same, same language. Uh, and it's whether intentionally or through culpable disregard, a uh, violation has been, been committed. I, I think it speaks volumes that we don't have a defendant here today that just completely disregarded the process, doesn't care. Um, and, you know, maybe there's an innocent inference from that, but, um, you know, the, the defendant had an opportunity to come and explain, oh, this was just an innocent mistake, but they've not done that. And actually, I agree with, yeah, sorry. Sure. Um, one, so I'll, the one thing that I'll offer is that what we're considering is the nature of the violation. Um, I think, you know, you're, the commissioners, you're welcome to draw inferences as you like in respondents' non-appearance. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I personally am uh, on the fence between three and five um, because I, I don't know if I have sufficient information to call this a serious violation. Um, because, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure if I have enough information either to say it was a repeated violation. Uh, cause that's, that's what number five calls for. Um, I'm happy to be persuaded. Otherwise I saw secretary Gober's hand. Go ahead. 
I mean, even our own commissioner said that she received multiple mailers. Uh, I mean, that that's a repeated violation. Um, and so in, in so far as a campaign finance violation at the city level can ever be serious, I, I would have a hard time thinking of them being more serious than this in terms of the, the degree of violation. But in maybe perhaps in terms of expediency, if we vote for five and then if we don't pick up six, then we drop down to, to three would be my suggestion. Okay. When you said multiple, you were talking that you had gotten emails as well, right? I got a lot of stuff and I was gonna say, if I could better make the translation between section 2749 and 2748, I would, if I understood that better and had more understanding of the legalese, I would go with the stricter, the number five, frankly. Sure, uh, I'm, I'm happy to restate that relationship yeah. um, as I believe it's intended to be understood, which is that the the sanctions in 2748, specifically letter of notification, admonition, reprimand, and censure, so leaving out recommendation for removal from office since that doesn't apply in the campaign finance okay. space, that you apply the same criteria as far as who the object of the sanction is, you simply replace that with the respondent in a campaign finance case. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That makes it clear and that makes it definitely, I would support number five. Sure. Um, and see Commissioner Larner, go ahead. I just want to clarify that we're not basing uh, the level of sanction on Commissioner Kale's sort of uh, anecdotal uh, contributions that she received things in the mail or that and that the respondent didn't show up here. I don't think that that's relevant for the level of violation. It needs to be, in my opinion, uh, related to the action, not to whether or not they showed up at the commission hearing. Sure. Um, appreciate that comment, Commissioner Lerner. I think um, I'm happy to field other comments from commissioners if they have them related to that specific question. Um, I think uh, things that um, indicate a repeated violation potentially um, uh, include, uh, let me see if there, are, if I could find the. Well, four and five say serious or repeated. And unless, I mean, Mr. Littlefield only had the one mailer. So there, so. I mean, of course there's Twitter and Facebook, but um, every day it's on Twitter, you know, whatever. Sure, uh, and, and to clarify, we're looking at, um, we're currently talking about either three or five, four, four isn't on the table uh, in mm -hmm. this case. So three is a violation has been committed intentionally or through disregard, five is uh, a serious or repeated violation has been committed intentionally or through culpable disregard. Okay. Uh, commissioners, other. I, I just wanted to clarify something. Go ahead. Please. Yeah. I, I didn't present my anecdotal evidence as, uh, or my anecdote as Fine. proof of what the sanction should be. That was just, it had come up in the conversation. So I kind of threw that out there. I still believe the preponderance of evidence presented by Mr. Littlefield is what we should look at and certainly what I am looking at in this situation. And, and my comment just to say was not about you, Commissioner Kayla, was that I was here, what I was hearing is one of the record that yep. we weren't actually relying on something that was not in evidence. Gotcha. And for intentional or disregard of the chapter, I mean, I think they're clear that they understood the chapter, but they filed the um, tax exempt status seemingly with the intent of being an educational advocate, but it's easy to cross the line. So I have difficulty with intentional or disregard. Sure. 
I uh, saw Commissioner Laurie's hand. Yeah, and I, you know, someone correct me if I'm, I'm mistaking this for another party, but the last time when the respondents did appear and were arguing, to me, it was clear that they were very aware of where the lines might be and very consciously were trying to frame their actions as not encroaching on those. And so for me, that goes towards the seriousness and the intentionality of their conduct. So I just wanted to. Sure, Secretary Gober. On that line, actually, and I wish I had my note, uh, but I remember the uh, defend or the respondent's attorney using some word uh, like we uh, carefully crafted. I mean, they were they were very knowledgeable of what was going on, and they were trying to live on the line uh, and 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 at least and in the gray area. Well, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Littlefield, I do see your hand at, at this time. It's not appropriate to uh, talk, um, kind of ask questions to parties. I don't believe it is. I'm sorry. I know. Um, uh, Commissioner Danberg. Would it be appropriate for me to ask Mr. Littlefield what's going through his head? <laughs> That's the same thing. Yeah, no, at the, so we're, we're kind of past the point of uh, letting letting the parties talk. Um, we are in the sanction deliberation stage. Um, I think I think in the past we have asked um, uh, for opinions about sanctions. Um, but Commissioner Danberg, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that we had lots of, of discussion. It wasn't evidence because it wasn't sworn, but we had enough discussion with the respondent to know that they were trying to walk a line. And I think that as a group, we have decided with our conviction of violation that they failed to walk that line on the correct side. Sure, sure. I think, I think our previous vote finding that a violation occurred is sufficient to say that they failed to walk the line. Um, and the question is whether that was an intentional crossing of the line or if it was a culpable disregard of city code that led to their crossing the line is the question. Um, commissioners, other, other thoughts or comments? Okay. Um, oh, yeah, Commissioner Danberg. I have a motion. Please state your motion. My motion is that the sanction should be 2-7-4923. Uh, the RF, the, the serious or repeated one. Okay, uh, commissioners, you've heard the motion. Uh, is there a second? So, th so just to Lynn clarify, Carter. this is um, Lynn Carter, Carter from the yes. attorney's office. Do you mean two dash seven dash four eight five? Well, I think four nine is the is the political ones. So, so um, let me let me kind of put a pause on on the motion uh, and just clarify. Um, so, two dash seven dash four eight C five is a letter of censure, um, and two dash seven dash four eight C three is a letter of reprimand, um, and and these are equally applicable in the campaign finance context as we kind of discussed under two seven four nine F. So would you like to restate the motion in terms of the uh, the name of the sanction notification going from least severe to most severe that's available to us right now? Notification, admonition, reprimand, censure. Yes, censure, thank you. Okay, so the motion is that the sanction we apply is a letter of censure. 
Okay. Motion by Commissioner Danberg. Is there a second? See a second from Secretary Gober. All right. Further discussion on the motion, commissioners? Yes, Vice Chair O'Hurry. I think you're muted. Yes, I, all right. I had not yet formed an opinion and I was just sitting here listening to uh, everything and really trying to debate what is fair and what's appropriate and what uh, will continue to instill trust in city elections. And one thing that I always struggle with is I think people should only be held accountable to the black letter law and uh, every person should make honest attempts to follow the law. And obviously, and I, I am in agreement with the position that, the, that this commission has taken, but it does seem that the respondent uh, at least tried to understand the law to the best of their ability and apply it to the best of their ability. And they just were wrong <laughs> as far as the commission is concerned. But, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have a Rolodex of every case and every opinion that we've had or every result, but I don't know that we've dealt with something like this specifically. And so maybe there isn't as much precedent for this issue in terms of dealing with 501 c It's not just some organization that popped up and didn't know anything about what they were doing, but an organization that really tried to make sure that they fell within what they thought were federal guidelines as well as city of Austin guidelines. And again, may, you know, there's an argument where they're being as true to the law as they should have been. Certainly there is that argument, but there, I don't think there's an argument that we've had several of these type of cases involving 501c4s that just got it wrong. Um, and we would expect that any sophisticated attorney or organization that attempted this in the future would be aware of the uh, commission's position now, and so um, without speculating or just offering an opinion on something that we don't have in front of us, I, I would say it's hard for me to say that it's it's a repeated violation because this is this is one of the few times or first times it seems like that we're taking up something this specific. It's, it definitely is a violation. I just don't know that I would go as far as. Uh, asking for a censure. Those are just my thoughts. Sure. Thank you for that. Commissioner Greenberg. And we've always had trouble with intentionality, um, whether it was this type of violation or some other type of violation. Intentionality is pretty difficult for us to know, um, which is how we often end up with a letter of admonition because we don't know about intentionality they seem to intend to educate. And we've sort of talked about them walking the line and falling on the wrong side, but that's not intentionality. Commissioner Lowry, and then Secretary Gilbert. Um, and maybe someone who's been on the commission longer can speak to this better, but you know, my understanding is intentional and just from other areas of law, um, intentionality refers to whether the conduct itself was intentional, not whether there was an intent to violate the law. Um, and I don't read this as any different from that. So just to um, Commissioner Greenberg's point, it's well taken, but for me, it's evaluating whether the conduct in question, which we agree is a violation, whether the conduct itself was done intentionally rather than recklessly or mistakenly. Sure. Uh, appreciate that comment and, and to maybe uh, kind of simplify the distinction it's whether or not um, whether or not they made these communications intentionally not whether or not they intentionally said this is the law and I'm going to violate it by making these communications is that the distinction you're drawing okay um, yeah exactly okay secretary Gober I saw your hand and then I'll go to commissioner Kale the reason I'm going to vote for censure is while I agree that the entity is sophisticated, or I believe the entity is sophisticated and hired, hired an attorney, I don't think it was to hire an attorney to comply with the law. I think it was 
to push the envelope as far as it possibly could uh, to try to skirt the law, to try to avoid the uh, rep rep repercussions of the law. And, and I think that was all done with purpose. I think it was all done with intent. And, and I think they're just testing the fences and seeing how far they can go. Uh, and that's why I'll go for central. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kale. Yeah, and I wanted to point out something in that, specifically in the wording in number five. So it says a letter of censure um, is appropriate when the commission finds that a serious or repeated violation has been committed intentionally or through culpable disregard. So if we find that they culpably disregarded this, we don't have to say, I mean, it's either intentional or it's through culpable disregard. You don't have to prove the intentional intentionality of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Danberg. If I may suggest, let's go with my motion, which is censure. And if we don't get the adequate votes, we'll talk about another path. Sure, um, appreciate that. Uh, uh, my, I'll add my comments unless there are other commissioners that wanna kind of weigh in. Um, my thoughts on this motion, I am inclined to vote in favor of it. And I think it's precisely because of what Commissioner Kale said, that culpable disregard. Um, and I think what uh, Secretary Gober is describing in, you know, the fact that they had, uh, and, you know, they had professional help in managing the operation. Um, and to me, uh, working very hard to uh, do everything they could to oppose Prop A without using magic words, um, to me, seems like a culpable disregard of our rules. Um, I, that, that, those are my two cents. I think uh, we've, we've kind of talked through this enough. Um, are there other comments or discussions before we go to a vote? Okay. I do, I do need a second. It, Oh, you had a second. It was Secretary Gober who seconded it. Yeah. Okay. So there's a uh, Commissioner Lerner. Go ahead. I don't. I don't really know where my comment falls, to be honest with you. But I wasn't here for the preliminary hearing, so I'm struggling to, to. I'm not responding to the evidence in the same way the rest of you are. Um, I just don't. I'm not feeling it in the same way as I was here for the first part. So I, I'm struggling to kind of know where to go with the vote, just to be honest. So I'm not really sure what that means. Um, sure. Um, you know, uh, what uh, What I would just recommend, Commissioner Lerner, uh, the evidence that we have in front of us right now is the most that we've had in terms of evidence, um, in terms of submissions by either side. Um, discussions at the preliminary hearings were talking about evidence and talking about issues surrounding uh, what uh, 501c4 can and can't do, what they really are. Um, uh, so I would uh, just encourage you to review the evidence that's in front of you. Um, uh, the, the statements at preliminary hearings are informative, but I think the evidence before us is sufficient as well. Okay. Commissioners, other, other thoughts or comments? Just that okay. if you yeah. miss if you miss the preliminary hearing, you can always um, listen to the recording. Yeah, that's fair. Um, that's just a comment. Sure, I saw. Uh, was it uh, Commissioner Kale's hand or Commissioner Lari's? Uh, Commissioner Kale, go ahead. I was just going to say, do we need to take a vote at some point as to whether we can go past ten p.m., Luis? We uh, at some point. Uh, yes, I don't expect us to take more than uh, 18 minutes in disposing of the sanctions uh, element of this. And okay. then if we uh, need to for remaining items on the agenda, I think we can at that time. Yeah, I don't expect us to have a hard uh, crash like we did in January. That will okay. prevent us from taking that vote yeah. uh, if we need to. Uh, okay. No other discussion, uh, commissioners? 
Um, okay, then in that case, I'm going to start the vote and I'll do it the same way that I have in prior votes. So when I call your name, please unmute yourself, clearly state your vote. I will repeat the vote back to you um, and then we'll tally at the end, okay? Okay, so this is on a motion to send a letter of censure. And I will start. Chair Sobron votes aye. Vice Chair O'Hurry. Uh, nay. Secretary, Vice Chair O'Hurry votes nay. Secretary Gober. Aye. Secretary Gober votes aye. Commissioner Danberg. Aye. Commissioner Danberg votes aye. Commissioner Greenberg. No. Commissioner Greenberg votes nay. Commissioner Kale. Aye. Commissioner Kale votes aye. Commissioner Lari. Aye. Commissioner Lari votes aye. Commissioner Lerner. Can I abstain? You can abstain. That's an option. Would, would you, is that an abstention? Okay. Commissioner Lerner abstains. Commissioner McCormick. Aye. Commissioner McCormick votes aye. Commissioners Ryan and Via Lobos are not present. And uh, Chair Soberon? Yes. I'd like to actually change my vote as well to an abstain. To an abstain? Yes. Okay, Vice Chair O'Hurry marked as abstaining. So with that, I count one, two, three, four, five, six voting in favor, two abstentions, one no vote, and two absent. Lynn, is that is that a correct count? Correct. Okay. And I believe with that, the motion passes, correct? I, I see nods. I'm, I'm, I always wait on Lynn for the... Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm having trouble with my mouse. Not a problem. Okay, the motion passes. Um, commissioners, thank you. Um, this has taken months um, to get to this point, uh, but I appreciate your patience over the course of the months and particularly this evening. Uh, Commissioner Lari, um, you are welcome to leave if you like. Uh, thank you for sticking around for this as well. Thank you, Mr. Littlefield as well for being here and for presenting. Really appreciate it and we'll see you soon. Okay. All right, commissioners. Um, so that brings us to agenda item four. Before we get there, let me see. Um, how about this? I am just going to ask an open